Okay, so um, it's my privilege to introduce Christian Samaratnam to us. Um, he's a friend um, of mine from England, and we've known each other for about, I think, 7, 16, 17 years or so. And uh, I moved to York in the north of England in about 2004. And we kept it relatively quickly through a church called St. Michael the Belfry and uh, struck up a friendship. And I'm going to kind of ask him to tell us a bit about himself anyway. And I'm, we're going to come and do a bit of a Q&A. But I wanted to just endorse him to you um, because he's, he's a, a man that I really look up to and admire. And uh, he's kind of faithfully been in church leadership for over 20 years uh, in different ways. Um, and he's just a man of wisdom and a man of integrity, and uh, I've often sat with him and been able to really pick his brain over all kinds of issues, particularly about 15 years ago, I was going through a process of thinking about ordination and tracking with him. I was in a prayer group with Christian and, and another vicar, and they were just, they were very patient with my questions, we'll put it that way. I had lots of um, fiery young man questions, and he just would sit very, very patiently with me and give really good answers and go, well, that's because, well, that's because. And uh, I really, really appreciate him. He's a good friend. Uh, and I think we're really going to love having him during this time. I think he's going to uh, really bring the right pieces for us to think about how we move forward. But he's a man of great experience too, and but, but theologically and uh, uh, rooted, if you like, in, in, in the word and in the, in the Anglican world as well. So do you want to come up, Christian? And I will uh, ask you a few questions to tease out a little bit of your pipiha. Um So, uh, where do you live? And tell us a bit about your family. Uh, I'll just pause for a sec. Um, Carl, Carl in the car uh, tried to, to explain to me that there was a very special way I had to introduce myself, which involved mountains and rivers and my parents. <laughs> and, um, and I think he he said it's really simple, and he started. And anyway, I think he realised. It wouldn't be happy, uh, it wouldn't work well. So he said, um, no, it's your first time, they'll, pro they'll probably won't mind. Um, so anyway, but it's, it's a great delight to be here. I've absolutely been looking forward to uh, being with you and sharing our uh, time together. So uh, um, looking forward to us getting to know each other. Um, uh, family, what's the question? Yeah, family, where are you from? Yeah, so my wife, Amanda, and Amanda will be here tomorrow evening, so you, you might get to uh, meet here. She uh, decided that if I was coming here for work, she should be able to come here for some fun. Uh, so she's whizzing around seeing family and friends that have uh, emigrated. So I'm married to Amanda. We live in York in the north of England, uh, which is a medieval city uh, with a history that goes back to 10,000 BC. Uh, it's great fun taking Americans around York because the, the dates just just frazzle their mind. Uh, <laughs> um, so it's a beautiful place uh, to live, as Carl knows, and if any of you have visited, um, you will know that. And we've lived there for 20 years, um, and I've done various different things uh, there. I have three children. Uh, my eldest, Kate, uh, works uh, near London. My son, Philip, uh, is in Nottingham, and he recently had a kidney transplant. My wife is, was the donor. Uh, so that, that was the beginning of our year. Uh, a very interesting uh, time, and I feel like I, you know, whenever my wife needs something from now on, she will be able to have it because uh, she donated <laughs> sacrificially part of herself uh, to keep our son uh, alive. So that's our middle child, uh, Philip, and then my youngest daughter uh, is Hannah. This is how much I love you. Tomorrow is her twenty-first birthday, oh, wow. and I, uh, before I said yes, I, I had to ask her permission um, to be here. Uh, so she said, it's okay, Dad, you can make it up to me. <laughs> um, so she's probably a smart one. <laughs> um, I suppose what would a mountain be in York? It would be just the castle um, mound, wouldn't it? York is very, very flat. <laughs> What's the castle mound called? It's Foss, no. uh, uh, Clifford's Tower. Clifford's Tower, that's your yeah. mountain. And then River Foss, River Ooze. 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 <laughs> so, how did you become a Christian? Um, have you always have you always been a Christian? No, my parents weren't Christians. My father, Sri Lankan, uh, grew up in a Methodist faith, but really wasn't very interested. Moved over to the UK and lived a very different 
uh, life, and my mother, not a church going um, background. So I, I, as far as I know, never went to church or had any contact with organised um, religion during my first um, 18 years. I was very, I was kind of a confirmed uh, atheist, and that all made complete sense to me. Uh, when I got to university, I had this bunch of friends on my course. I studied pure mathematics and theoretical computation. It seemed like a good idea at the time. Um, and uh, I had a bunch of friends in my course. And um, we were talking about love earlier. Um, I was strongly attracted to the life they lived, their contentment, uh, their care and concern um, for each other. And unfortunately, they were Christians. But I was, I was willing to overlook that as a good humanist uh, in order to be their friend. And I think through a process of osmosis, um, I became inducted uh, into Christianity. And before Alpha, and I worked for Alpha for 15 years, but actually what sealed it for me was beginning to meet them weekly on Wednesday afternoon when they had a small room together and they would just talk and share, they would read some of the Bible, they would pray for each other. My friend Tim kept a log of their prayers and then they would review at the next meeting and Tim would tick off, you know, oh, Carl's trouble sleeping, how are you doing Carl? Oh great, great, that's one to thank God for. And that one, okay, we'll keep praying for that. And, and what began as, I just thought it was laughable and oh, you know, they're deluding themselves. And, but over time I saw the depth of it and I, and I knew God was calling me and I had quite a dramatic sort of darkness to light conversion experience, which uh, was in a meeting and hearing someone speak. It wasn't particularly kind of a Pentecostal thing or anything like that. I just, there was a moment when I felt God say to me, I needed to respond to him um, and to follow him. And uh, so that kind of changed my whole world uh, and everything that I thought I would do changed and, and uh, uh, coming to faith kind of led me in a different direction. So we've said that you have a bit of a background in church planting. Um, have you always been involved with that? How did you get into that? What's your church background? My first job was with an Anglican church in the city of Coventry. I uh, was employed as a verger. I didn't even know what it was. <laughs> I just, uh, the vicar asked me and I said, I like the vicar and I said yes. And I, realized I didn't even know what the job entailed. The job entailed being the keeper of 112 keys, <laughs> cleaning the choir boy's toilets, oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, ironing the vicar's this, that, and the other, vestments, um, and occasionally, you know, walking around looking, uh, looking important, but not really being uh, that important at all. Uh, so I did that for two years, and actually considered getting ordained in the church. The bishop actually asked, invited me for breakfast. It was, Obviously, how intimidated people you invite you around for breakfast, sit a boiled egg in front of you, and then <laughs> tell you, young man, you need to uh, be ordained in the Church of England. We need people like you. And um, I just, I, it, it, I just thought the Church of England's mad. I can't possibly be part of it. I still think it's mad, by the way, <laughs> but I've mellowed somewhat. Um, so, um, and then I, after that, I connected with a, a free church a network called New Frontiers. Uh, which was actually the, the church, the, the friends that led me to faith um, had been in. So that was my connection um, there. And um, uh, I'd been there a couple of years, and my friends George and Jill, George was one of the elders, announced one Sunday that they were going to be church planting. I'd never heard this, but it just sounded, you know, he said it in such a way that I just, it sounded really good. Um, so we asked him about what it was, and my wife and I just felt we would, we would walk alongside them and, and help them um, in this journey. So we kind of signed up to give them some money to help what they were doing, and we agreed to pray, and we agreed to visit, and we went to the prayer meetings, etc. And, and I didn't know at the time, but um, uh, church planting is contagious. And, and after a year, my wife and I felt called uh, to go church planting. Um, and so we, we kind of got caught up in that. And my wife actually said to me, she said, um, don't, for goodness sake, don't sign us up to go somewhere without talking to me, <laughs> unless it's York. <laughs> <laughs> the next day I was at the leaders meeting and they were saying, hey, we're, we've got some opportunities for church planting, various links have come up, 
there's one in Manchester, there's one in Durham, and we're looking for somebody from York, for York, anyone wants to go to York. So I just signed up on the spot. <laughs> Again, didn't know anything about what I was going to, but my wife had said we could go to York, so I thought, brilliant, we'll go to York. So that was about um, 25 years ago. And since then, I've, I've been pretty much all the time either involved in, uh, in a church plant or in a church uh, that's planting out. And actually, for me, that's become my normal. In fact, I often have to adjust when I'm in contexts where that isn't normal, because to me, it's so normal to be involved in starting a new Christian community or renewing a Christian community in a place or helping people explore that journey for themselves. Do you want me to mention G2? Like what, what was that about? G2, um, would any of you know St. Michael of Belfry Church that I've got mentioned earlier? Yeah, just mentioned yeah. David Watson? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So, 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 Michael, so Michael of Belfry was David Watson's church. Um, it's just next to uh, the Minster. There you go. That's, well, that's a very bad photo. I'll explain it in a minute. But, um, uh, so it's it's right at the heart of uh, of York, and um, we were both in that church, I think, at that time. And the vicar um, had a friend in Scotland, a Baptist friend, and their building needed a refurb, so they had to move out into a school uh, for six months while the building was refurbed. And what the Baptist minister said was. Oh, really interesting, uh, a whole new group of people came to visit and explore the church that didn't come before when we were in our churchy church building. So the idea was a, like a missional thought, does the building have any effect on the way the, the mission happens, does the style have any effect on that? So our, our vicar Roger Simpson uh, thought that was a that was an interesting idea. Could we explore this? Because we have, we also have this medieval building, beautiful but quite austere, quite imposing. Could, could easily, you could easily imagine it. It might put people off. I imagine once they'd come in, they would receive a good welcome. But coming in the door would be the biggest um, step. So G two kind of evolved as an experiment to to play with the idea of space. Would a, would a church in a third space? genuinely neutral venue, connect missionally with different people. And what might uh, a church look like in that um, space? So we had a year of thinking and planning uh, for it, and, and there were lots of kind of ideas. And in the end, we uh, committed to meeting in a, a, a David Lloyd gym, so that's quite an upmarket, quite an expensive gym, kind of a deluxe venue. Uh, we rented a room about this size, and it was laid out like this, round tables, chairs around the table. And it was the kind of venue that nobody would feel bad about going to it. If you said, do you want to come to our church? It's in, it's in the David Lloyd gym. People would go, oh, that sounds great. Yeah, we'd love to do that. Um, so that's how we launched um, G2. We made a lot of mistakes, and I'll mention some of those as we go on through some of our uh, sessions. Um, in fact, many of the things we thought we'd do, we didn't do. Many of the things that we hoped happened would happen didn't happen, but other things did happen. So we really did sort of learn on the way, and that was that was okay. We were kind of up um, for that journey. So I led G2 for about um, 14 years. Um, we always had a very low staffing. I was never more than two days a week uh, leaving the church because I had another job as well. Um, at the time, and we did a we really connected with a younger age group. Seventy percent were under the age of thirty. Um, we planted one church. We planted out. The average age of the team was twenty-two, uh, but that wasn't inconsistent with who we were. We just had a very young profile of people, and we again we learned a lot along the way. We learned how to engage with different age groups. Learned how to engage with the changes of how. Every few years, there are differences, for example, in the students that are going to the city, uh, etc. And we saw a lot of people released into mission and, and going off to do church plants or other kinds of things from that. Um, do you want to comment a little bit on your job with Alpha and then just sort of segue, how did that, how did that kind of develop into your current role? What are you doing at the moment? Yeah. 
Um, do you all know Alpha? We've indoctrinated the whole world, haven't we? <laughs> uh, so I had the privilege of working for Alpha for 15 years, um, full-time initially and then part-time, as I've mentioned, so I was leading um, church as well. Initially, I was, I was employed as a regional director, and the, the aim was to prevent everything from being run by London. Uh, and where we lived in the north, the, the worst thing you could do to someone in the north is have someone from London tell us how it should be done. Even if they're right, they're wrong. Because we don't. So um, we realised we needed to be regionally located, and then we realised we could do the same in Scotland, we need to do the same in Northern Ireland, we need to do the same in uh, Wales, and then we also, the rest of England is still a big place, and so we ended, we ended up regionalising our staff uh, around the whole of the UK. Um, I worked uh, mostly as part of the UK team, and I, I, I did some stuff with the European team as well. And in, uh, in, Alpha, in Alpha, in the UK, um, there's a very high take-up. Um, something like a third of the churches run Alpha. So it's, it's, kind, of a, it's kind of a given thing. It's, a, it's, it's almost a part of normal Christianity that you're running Alpha, or if you don't like Alpha, you're running something that's similar but is a different one. So that's very... The culture of Christianity in England is very shaped around churches are running inquiry courses that people can come on and there is a structured relational way for them to find out uh, about Jesus. Uh, our team looked after prisons uh, and we, we supported Alpha's running in um, half of the UK prisons uh, in Northern Ireland which, are, which include a lot of paramilitary uh, contexts very dangerous place to be involved with prisons. We worked in all um, the prisons. Uh, we ran a marriage course and marriage preparation course. And sometimes for people that was their way in. They maybe did a family course or a parenting course, uh, or they uh, wanted to get married in a church. So the vicar would say, "We have a preparation course for you," and then they might do that and go on um, to do um, Alpha. And um, Alpha's had a significant effect on. The salvation story in our nation, actually. Uh, I've had several bishops tell me that, in their opinion, half of the people they confirm um, as adults or older teens will cite Alpha as part of their story. Maybe not the whole story, maybe just the beginning, maybe it's the middle, maybe it was the end, but it's, be it's become a big part of uh, how churches help people explore um, and express their faith. So I did that for um, 15 years and uh, loved it enormously, but reached the point where I thought, I think I either move or I stay until I retire and do Alpha. So I moved uh, to work for St. Hill College, which is where I work now. Uh, like yeah. yeah. Um, so um, the job I currently do came out of a uh, conversation with the, the principal, uh, Mark Powley. And Mark and I were once at uh, uh, a church planting meeting where there were loads of stories being told and the day was excellent until the final hour when somebody had a go at saying this is what I think we should do and the day was excellent but that final hour was quite poor and I remember sitting next to Mark and saying I hope there's somebody with some better ideas than these we could do a lot better and then I, I, I remember saying to him do you know what I think a theological college could make a significant impact in this area. But it was just kind of one of those thoughts where I thought, hey, there you go, there's a present, just give you a thought, go off and sort that out, I'll carry on doing the rest of my life. And that came back and, and eventually materialised as an opportunity to work within the college, to springboard out of the college, to see how could we support, encourage, resource, and do anything to assist um, church planting um, in the north of England, in the region. So some of what I do is internal. We train Anglican and Baptist board names. Um, we have programs for those. Uh, we have independent students uh, and ministers who are returning maybe to do a master's. And we have church planting modules that they can uh, do and, and tracks, etc. that they can be part of so that we can give um, 
uh, someone who's training to be ordained can receive a theological formation that has a strong sense of intent that they may be primarily involved in starting a new Christian community in some shape or form. And I'll get to this when we talk tomorrow, but that's for us, that's increasingly the normal assumption of what ministry will be shaped like um, in the UK for the rest of this decade um, and beyond. And so we do that within the college and then a large working um, uh, through dioceses to support them in what they're doing in church planting. And um, I've heard a little about what is here, but our, our dioceses are all very different and they really like the fact that they're different from each other. So I, I work with 12 dioceses, particularly in the north, and it's like having 12 <laughs> friends that are completely different in their personality, <laughs> and they talk in a different way, and you dress differently. By the way, he said to me, you need to wear a black clerical shirt. <laughs> <laughs> he said, they'll expect it. <laughs> so I packed my black clerical <laughs> shirt, and then it turns out, I'm the only one. <laughs> I'll press down tomorrow. Um, so we work with different dioceses, and each diocese is, is in effect independent in its own uh, mission, and there is a lot of variety in how it's being worked out um, in different dioceses. But we want we want to support that with training, but not just uh, not just the delivery of practical training, but we want we want to get the full reflective cycle in there. Because we are not just teaching people to do something, we are also learning at the same time. Like I said about G2, we learn a lot. So a college is uniquely placed, I think, to also uh, walk alongside, to do, to do field research, to gather data, to, uh, to, divide, to understand what types of, um, you know, what theological questions are arising from things that are happening and how can we think about those and then and then cycle that through so that that feeds into the, the body of knowledge we're discovering or rediscovering about the mission of the church and um, uh, uh, that, that improves the training that we're, we're doing. And my conviction is we are rediscovering ancient ministry. Uh, but perhaps in that period from the Second World War, we've had a rather static view of our parish in my country and we're rediscovering some of the more normal wisdom that probably existed in ages past about mission and church and new expressions of church being part of the normal ministry of, of the work um, that we do. So we feel like we're not so much making something up as discovering what those that went before us uh, knew and, and applying it for our day. Okay, I'll stop. I mean, to be fair, you did, and when I met you off the plane, you were wearing that outfit. Not true. <laughs> not true, not true. Okay, but he did sleep in it. No, that's not true. Right. Um, I'm going to stop there so that you can kind of give us a bit of an intro to your time. Final question, and I'm going to get out of the way. What, what's your favourite food, and, and why? <laughs> um, my, he knows the answer to this. My favourite food is lamb biryani. And the, well, the reason he's thinking of it is because he, myself and uh, Carl and our friend, the three of us who were in this prayer um, triplet, went away. And Carl cooked for us an amazing lamb uh, biryani. Uh, so, <laughs> but that is my favourite food. But you only cooked it because it was my favourite food. Yes, it's true. He didn't buy me around for a lamb. And he was very worried that he would cook it in the wrong way. Uh, so we had lots of conversations about how did my family and do it. But my father never told me, so I, you know, I was just making up my answers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, we've got till five. Let's see how we go. Um, I'm slightly nervous that I don't know you. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, so part of my um, task, you know, today and as, as we unfold, is to listen really carefully uh, to you and your story. Because uh, I really want to scratch where you're itching. Uh, I don't want to just come in and say, hey, this is what I'd want to say. So and I'm really happy to adjust on the fly. So do, do give me feedback and tell me, you know, what, what is it you want to hear more about. So I have a plan that we can adjust the plan to suit what you would most want to hear. Uh, second, um, we've got lots of breaks and in-betweens. And so I'm, I'm here, I'm present for all of this. 
I, I would love to chat. Uh, I would love to hear about what you're uh, doing. That helps me. That that enriches me. And if you if if you wanted to ask me questions, or you want to do that one to one or a small group, then um, I would love to do that and are available um, to do that. My big disclaimer is that um, I know my context really well. Forgive me if my illustrations are inevitably England centric. So I should. I should speak about that which I know, but I don't presume that that will be what is right here. It may be, it may not be, it may be slightly different, it may be very um, different. So do push back uh, if that's not the case, and I won't know unless you tell me um, that that's the case. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm also not coming with the heart of saying, I know the answers and I'm going to deliver them to you. I, I very much feel like, in our context, it's such early days and we are still learning how to do this well. And actually, for every success story, I can tell you probably one or two, you know, not success, struggle, tragedy, you know, a very unfortunate outcome stories. I can tell you about plans that went wrong. So I don't, and neither do I want to convey that sense um, that um, it's all going well with us. Uh, there is a reality to ministry, and particularly when we do pioneering things, that we need to be quite resilient in the way that we walk, uh, willing to accept failure as a way of learning, uh, willing to take chances, uh, able to measure the risk of things that we do. And also I find learning to be flexible and to adapt. And we are living in an age when there's never been a greater flux of culture, as, as we heard uh, Nigel explaining earlier. Uh, that, that, that shift of culture is in very high flux um, at the moment. And here, as well as where I am, um, COVID will have thrown everything up in the air. We still don't really know quite what church post-COVID looks like because it's still settling uh, after the storm, after the upset. So those are my uh, all my disclaimers. And you'll meet my wife tomorrow, and then you'll like me a bit more when you meet her. So <laughs> she'll be nice, uh, me. The picture on the screen is the view from my office. Uh, I said it was a medieval city. Um, my office is built over where it's for Constantine the Great lived. Uh, he was uh, crowned emperor of the Roman Empire in 327. AD, and it's thought that statue uh, over in the corner is where he was um, crowned. We can't really know for certain, but it's um, thought. So, um, you know, that just gives you a sense of, you know, where I am during the week and the view um, that I have. Um, and that's your minister uh, off at the side there. I've said a bit about St. Hild um, College. So this is my current passion to to generate a useful resource for church planting at the heart of a, of a theological college. And primarily we are preparing uh, ministers for ministry in the church. And uh, it's a time of rapid change actually in terms of thinking about theological education. We recognize we have patterns that are very weighted towards uh, academic process. Uh, assumptions that if you write good essays, you'll be a good minister, that kind of um, assumed thinking that lurks behind being a college. Um, especially if you sort of aspire to be a really good college, then actually you sort of champion the students that get the really, you know, you, that's where your gravity kind of goes. Your results are published and you want your percentages to be going higher. And church planting has forced us to um, see that. Um, Historically, the church has not been uh, as good at recognizing some of the people that God is calling to ministry. Uh, we, for example, have something we call the Peter Stream. And the Peter Stream is a recognition that um, the Church of England uh, loves somebody like St. Paul. St. Paul, clever lad, good family. Expensive education, <laughs> did well, speaks well, knows the right people, tells you the name of his tutor and you think, oh yes, 
Well, she's Jamaican. Wow, that's impressive, Paul. We like people like Paul. We know what to do with them, and they've had a very easy channel sort of through um, the life of the church. Um, but what about Peter? <laughs> Working class man? Successful, he ran a business that survived without him, so he wasn't unsuccessful. Um, perhaps couldn't even read. Maybe his literacy was low. Quite a hothead. Probably not looking to go to college and learn ancient languages or anything uh, like that. And yet Jesus gives Peter the keys to the kingdom of heaven, commissions him uh, to take the church forward. Uh, so there is some redressing taking place at the moment where we're recognising actually we, are, we have shown historically bias um, against people who might be being called um, to the ministry uh, of the church. And, and the work I do particularly seems to touch that. And particularly in church planting, we'll get into this tomorrow, but in, in church planting, it's, it's not just about uh, the, the knowledge that you've gained. It's also about something of the practitioner skills that you've developed and nurtured. And that there is an essential combination that's necessary there. And that, for example, that means that people that are going to be trained to church planting, it, it would be really important for them to have had some evidentiary experience of that before we train into that to then deploy them out to do that. Because there's something of a pioneer inclination, mindset, aptitude that's essential to make um, that work. So we're, we're working in that. So I mentioned that even this morning I was sending some emails about our Peter stream and how we would change some things and some names of candidates and um, uh, how we adjust to that and how we make the system work um, for them. Um, uh, yeah, I won't say more about it. Um, I've just recorded uh, a series, which you'll be able to get here if you wanted, um, called Exploring Church Planting, a film series, five sessions. And we produced this because we recognise that um, we want to encourage churches to explore if they might do some church planting. And to do that, we need some kind of method where uh, a minister can 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 take their whole church through some kind of primer, you know, just, just to cover the basics. So this is a very basic five-part series that covers the basics and also gives lots of different examples so that people who, who might think, church planting, yes, I know what that is, they can hear four or five other examples that might be very different so they can see the huge variety of and flavour of uh, what's... Um, uh, what's happening uh, in church planting, and then hopefully um, takes the, the church and the congregation to the point where they can actually um, work out, okay, what might we be doing next in our context? So I feel like I'm signing you up for things, but I'm not trying to sell you anything. Um, uh, I'm also working on this project called Seabed. Does anyone know where the word Seabed comes from? In 1534, in the Counter-Reformation, the Catholic Church met in Synod, and they concluded that their theological preparation was not sufficient to the mission that was in front of them. And they decreed, and at the time, education happened in each church, and I imagine it varied a lot. And perhaps it wasn't as deep and complex as they needed uh, to be. So the church, the Catholic Church, uh, resolved that they need to improve that in order to improve their ministry. And they decreed that in each, in each diocese, there should be created a place set aside for theological learning. And that place would be called a seminary. Seminary. And if you translate seminary, it's the word seedbed, which is an interesting play on the idea of planting. Um, and uh, you can, I've got some stuff in my book, I'll mention my book tomorrow, but um, you can pick out different threads through history of the way that the word planting 
has been used. But I think the Council of Trent were in effect saying, we want to plant equal, enriched soil in a community of learning and formation in order to grow them to be ready for the task that was ahead. So we've, we've shamelessly stolen that word um, because we want to create a programme um, for training, and this our programme will be for lay people. Um, the church has made a, a significant commitment to church planting. Um, the commitment is to plant 10,000 new Christian communities in the next decade. I don't know if we'll do it, but anyway, we're going to have a go and see what we can do with that. But any logic, any thinking through that tells us that we must utilise lay people in the church to play their part in it. I mean, just practically, it takes, what, seven to nine years to, to train and deploy a priest from beginning to end. It costs a certain amount of money. There are cheaper ways and more expensive ways, but however you add it up, if you multiply that by 10,000, you get to enormous amounts of money that we don't have. And yet the wisdom of history and of many other nations is that what we're talking about, church planting, new Christian communities, doing mission through the church, is, is often the work of ordinary people who do it just as part of their baptised Christianity, that it's something that they're uh, called to. So we want to invest in that and we try to devise um, a programme of training that can run for one year, that's accessible, has combinations of online and, and, and meeting up, but the kind of thing you can, you can squeeze into a, a job and that's the practical uh, challenge. And that will give them uh, not, not everything you might want to cover theologically to prepare somebody, but would give them a theological <laughs> and formational journey that should help them to make the next steps um, in doing that. And then some follow on years through learning communities and support groups. And the second part that we've identified is um, we also need to work with the evangelists. Evangelist is a very broad word, I think. It was a very wide range of um, uh, types of engagement. It includes Billy Grahams, who wants to stand on the stage and preach. It, it's people who like to gossip their faith as we were being encouraged earlier. How would you speak about this? Uh, people who would share that with their neighbour over the fence or a person um, at the bus stop. It includes the person who's good at explaining things. It's, it includes the person on Alpha who's just a magnificent host on Alpha and actually the main job of a small group leader on Alpha is to not say too much, but to let people talk and chat about the gospel and see where that gets them. It includes the old ladies that are praying for people on a prayer list uh, and everyone else. So it even includes people that wouldn't be comfortable with the word evangelist. And we're convinced that evangelists are uh, key to not the church and to church planting. That we don't want to presume that if we start a new Christian community or we plant a church, it will automatically grow. The experience over the recent decades is that church plants do grow, but we're also seeing a diminishing return. And there is a presumption that um, something, something that people might come to, people do come to. Um, we are finding evangelism is getting harder. In fact, I've got a friend that's done some research that says, in England, the further north you go, the harder it is. He does it in Newcastle, in, you know, nearly the northmost point of, of England, so I'm not surprised he holds that uh, opinion. But it's it's... Probably something like that. We've observed that, that evangelism is becoming uh, harder and less people are looking for a church or even open to an invitation. So we need to be active, rather than just passive, you are welcome if you want to come. We need to be active, as Jesus said, you go out to the highways and the byways and you call people to come in. So um, seedbed is something uh, we're working on. As well, we want to mobilise the whole church, not just clergy, not just people who are employed to work in churches, but people who have everyday regular jobs who can also play their part 
in this. Um, and last, I have written a few books. Uh, the one on the left is, is not as big as it looks. It's a short little booklet I did while I was at Alpha, um, and I can email that to you. It's free, it's just a PDF. Um, the book in the middle is, is the result of my doctoral uh, studies, and I, I looked at um, medieval craft. Have you heard of craft guilds? So in Europe, for about 700 years, the craft guilds were trained. Every, everyone was trained in a guild for about 700 years, and they did their work through that. It was like a trade union and a college sort of rolled into uh, one. And it was, it was about on-the-job training. It was about learning in the workshop, and it was about being apprenticed, and it was about going on wandering years to discover new skills, and it was about demonstrating mastery through uh, evidence, evidence of your learning. Um, and so I, I, f I felt we'd been doing some apprenticeship in our church, uh, particularly with younger leaders, and I wanted to explore that, so that's what I did my doctorate on, and then I rewrote the material um, for a book. I have brought some with me, and I'll, I can let you have it at cost price, which would be $25. I'm told this, that's not too expensive. Okay. You can give me more if you want. <laughs> 25 is, is basically what I paid to get it. So, um, and I'd rather not take them back to England. So um, do buy one if, uh, if you're interested um, in those. I, I don't know if I can do an electronic money. We can do that. We can do it. Oh, okay. okay, so we can sort something out. So have a word if you'd like, one of those. And then the last one I'm working on is um, I'm trying to unpack some of the reasons for planting churches in networks. So what are the benefits of church planting to a diocese? And I think many are unrecognised. And I think they're important, particularly to our corporate um, renewal. And I'll, I'll do some of that in our final um, session, but I'm, I'm also writing that up uh, as a book. Okay, well, let me set the scene a little bit for... Uh, what we might do tomorrow uh, and the day after. Um, just a snapshot of where we are, and I'd be very interested to hear where, where you are as well, Christianity and, and your uh, diocese. Using the last big data that we had before uh, COVID-19, which is a very reliable survey, all churches have to do it, so every church submits a return, and it's very, it's very good to be able to track data points um, through every year. Um, the the Church of England's statisticians who reviewed the data said that we have seen catastrophic decline over the last 10 years in terms of attendance and participation in church. And we are now in our eighth decade of continual decline, which means anyone in, almost anyone in the church has never known a period when the church has overall been in growth. They may well have been in a great church, but overall, for our identity as the Church of England, uh, we have only known decline. And we'll come back to that, but I, I think that's mass massively shaped a ministerial mindset. If you've only ever known a general, consistent, pervading decline, then how you think and speak and act gets shaped by it ever so subtly becomes part of how you think. Um, and so church planting was subverting that, and that can be quite challenging, be quite uncomfortable to dream what might it look like to reach people that we thought we couldn't reach, to try things that we didn't think had worked um, before. Uh, one stat is that an 18-year-old is eight times less likely to be in church than an 81-year-old, and it should also add we have a lot of 81-year-olds, and our graph of age, you know, jumps up. So we have a very aged church, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it, what we have is a, a faithful, reliable, older generation, but we have missing generations increasingly as we get younger. And COVID has added additional challenges to that, as I'm sure it would have been for you. 10% of parishes are reporting growth. Uh, that either feels positive or negative. Only 10% of parishes are growing, or 10% of parishes are reporting growth. 
41% are in significant decline. And then just to give you an idea of the size, I was talking to somebody, um, uh, Paul, earlier, and uh, I was saying we've got nearly 500 churches in our diocese. Um, so here's the explanation. Um, the average, so the middle church, the median church in the Church of England, before COVID, had on Sunday 26 people and one child, which means we have 8,000 parishes that have fewer than that on Sunday. And our numbers now are lower than that, probably 70%. I don't know whether that will come up or not. I don't know. So it would be lower um, than that. Interestingly, all the church plants that were tracked in this annual survey had grown. In number, they're smaller than the 16, you know, they're only a small part of that 16,000 data set. Um, but all the church plants have grown over five, five years. And on average, they have doubled in size over five years, on average. Let's pause a bit. I'm sure you, you know, you don't want to hear me talk for too long without pausing. Tell, tell me about your context. Just perhaps a few people, just tell me, what would your numbers be? What would your observations be? What would your, is it the same? Is it, are you doing better than us? Is it mixed? It's very mixed as well. Rural, urban, places of poverty, it varies enormously for us as well. So I'd love to hear three or four people just tell me something about your context. Christian, a few years ago when we had a similar gathering, we invited Peter Lyman, who's a, a retired professor of history, who's got a real interest in church history and, and demographics to spend some time with us, and I, I think those of us who were here, who were here, wouldn't be at all surprised to read the first sort of half of those statistics. Uh, in, in New Zealand, there was a particular graph that we put in front of us that showed church attendances in the peak in 1950, and Paul remember that, there was a bit of a statistician in his own way. It was about 1950, wasn't it? 1953. 1963, there we go. So we also are in our eighth decade of decline. And it's been a, just a steady decline since then. Our starting point is also much lower. So New Zealand's never been a big church going country. Well, do you know the percentage? So um, the research done by, I can't remember the guy, Evan Ward, at Oak University. One sister, he says, I think we've cracked twenty percent for the Kenyan church. Um, Just say that again, sir. Twenty percent. Okay. For the church of Kenya, that's eighty percent difference. I mean, everyone was kind of belonged to a church, but I only went for yeah. patch, match, and dispatch. Um, when, I, when I was in Scouts, you had to say what your religious affiliation was, and if you didn't know your church government, which yeah. was weird because there was no church government. It's always been the Church of New Zealand, so, so that's how out of those people work. Um, so, I, I, I mean, New Zealand was a place where people came to to get away from church. Mm -hmm. So, the kind of wealthy and middle class might have gone to church, but a lot of people came back to it not just very, very much. I'll go when I have to, but particularly me. Yeah. Interesting. Just what you said, our, our numbers are uh, just under 8% before COVID of the population attended a church of any denomination. And the Church of England's part of that was just under 2%, um, but it varies enormously. So, not far from me in Bradford, um, church attendance is 0.2% uh, of the population. Uh, so, that type of fluctuation is not, not uncommon at all. Let's hear a few more. I was just going to say, to place it in historical context, that figure of 20% that um, John cited, my recollection is that actually goes back to the beginning of the 20th century, mm -hmm. the, the beginning of the 20th century, and the of the 20th century. So that gives you a historical context for like the Romans. Yeah. Let's hear one we're facing the same, like, 81 and 18-year-olds. Yes. We'd all love to have 18-year-olds coming in the door. Yeah. 
but we spend a lot of our time supporting the 81 year olds. And increasingly, those are our age peers. We are. I mean, you don't look at them, so. <laughs> I'm three years, years off. <laughs> I'm, I'm three years off now. I still have okay. passion uh, for mission, but not the energy on my side. Why do you think you're not reaching 18 year olds? Um, there's a huge cultural gap. Yeah. I, I don't say I don't reach any 18 year olds, but I say that the, my, my perception for most of us now, involvement in the church here, we, we feel the burden of looking after the 81 year olds while we wonder about how we could spend more time and energy with the 18 year olds. Because yeah. that's, where, that's where it's life giving for us yeah. as well. But that's that, what we face is that, that not just the congregation, we feel our first duty is to minister to. The people that are coming in the door are old. We are also aging. So the ministers are, are aging. And that, that's my perception of the big one. Yeah. How do we change ourselves to be missional towards aging? Yeah. And there's a theory we reach roughly within 10 years of our own age, give or take. Some people are younger, younger at heart and will be able to stretch a bit further, but there's a limit to our primary ability to reach yeah. as individuals. We can work with others in teams to, uh, to change that. Um, it, but we, we also know we're going to be gone in 10 years. Okay. <laughs> if, we, if, that's, if that's us. Yeah. It's all, yeah, well, it's all very well for Abraham being called at the age of 75. But, you know, most of us, that we're long for the love of the tide by it. Yeah. I'll say this and then I saw your hand, I'll come to you next. Um, uh, at the church I led you to, very young, 70% under the age of 30. Um, can you guess what the most common request? Got from the people in their twenties was to do with older people. Can you find me a retired person to mentor me? They craved it. They were. They were. They saw the, the limits of just hanging around with everyone else who's twenty one, who also doesn't know anything. <laughs> And just calling their anxiety and their frustration. And they intuitively felt that in an older person, the wisdom of life would have been seasoned. Not not as not not as not meaning a successful old person, but as in a person that's old has been through life and would be able to help me build my foundation and direction forward. So I, I we have the same situation obviously but I, I feel there's something really interesting if only we can bring that together that the young need the old and the old need the young uh, and that that should be yeah. really what we feel in church yeah. I'm sure there's a lady in the back I think it's worth noting that it's not just the church that's the problem but also organisations like cultural values mm -hmm. yeah. people just seem to not want to belong to Yes. Sports clubs. Sports clubs. Yeah. 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 Sports. Yeah. Yeah. Sports. Yeah. 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 Yeah
So you don't have these big stories. And it um, doesn't mean there's not a need for that. I think it's like a great um, ability to be sustainable. Yeah, there's, there's a need for it. Like, do you have thoughts about how you adapt to that? I'm sure you do have thoughts. By giving the big stories. Okay. And storytelling. Yeah. And, and encouraging them, telling them about um, that there is there is something other than um, what it is that they know or that their families even know. And it's just, yeah. Yeah, in order to make their life better. And, there, and there's a big, um, and that there's a big need, uh, and there's something about being community and how it will work together as a community. Yeah. And that's important for their well being, for their lives, for their community. Yeah. And we, the previous generations, did not have to contend with the proliferation of digital media. Uh, if you have an 18 year old for an hour a week, then YouTube has them. The, who knows, 20 hours plus. Um, so the, that's a different ballgame, isn't it, in terms of uh, who is discipling their minds and their hearts. A couple more comments. I think uh, one of the other things that I think of is we, as church, we've done a little bit of a disservice to ourselves in terms of that, for want of another word, our branding. Because the voices that are heard in the public square that come from the church are often from the people on the extremes. Yeah. And we got um, some of those as well. Yeah. Yeah. The people that get caught, you know, get called on to speak yeah. are the ones that are right on the edges. We, we don't we I don't know, maybe it's an Anglican thing that we travel and we sort of like to hold all um, all the voices, but it's very rare that we actually get out in the public square and say the church thinks, or the Anglican church, or the Dice of Life thinks this. Um, and, and I do wonder if that, but, but what we're seeing in media is, is so distant from what actually is happening in many churches. That, yeah. Yeah. And I've mentioned on our TV whenever there is a Christian in a, in a drama. Mm-hmm. They, they're, they're usually a hypocrite or a terrorist, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. which is an unhelpful yeah. association, I feel. Well, they were both for some mid Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 There was a lady there. You would have your hand up. I'm sorry for pointing at that. Uh, it's 
see it get to uh, what, it, what it, um, the people that I've come back home to that I lived 30 years ago is the Mukumahos, which is great children and great grandchildren. Yeah. So it's reacquainting myself with all, even though like they're all my family. Yeah. And um, so things are not going to happen. Thank you so much for um, sharing. And, and this, I, I'm sure there's more. So we're connecting, yeah? This is fun. I'm enjoying this. And uh, we'll, uh, I'm hearing, uh, I love hearing what you've got to share. Um, just to give you an outline of where we're going to go, um, then uh, tomorrow morning, uh, I want to talk about um, establishing a mixed ecology of church in a parish that's full of jargon, isn't it? So I'll explain, I'll talk you through that, and I want to give you a particular model or perspective on church planting um, that from from the preliminary conversations um, might might be a way into this and maybe the most useful um, to you. So we'll talk about that in that session. Um, then then in the afternoon session we'll talk about the leaders and I've already highlighted, you know, how, how do we mobilise people to be involved in that? So I want to pick, pick out some of that, some of the uh, some of the ways we might do that, some of the challenges, some of the things we need to be really attentive to. And what is our role? In doing that, I don't want to make put a burden on you that you now need to go away and be 10 churches or three. You know, uh, I want to talk about how we can be overseers and releasers and how we can do that really well. So, we'll talk about that. And then in the final session, I want to maybe just throw out the big picture. We'll, we'll talk about some of the costs of being involved in any form of pioneer ministry and that we ought to weigh uh, and the cost for those that are, others that draw into that, and but also some of the opportunities. How might this type of activity actually have a very positive, renewing effect on a diocese to our corporate um, benefit rather than just, just the benefit of one um, place? May I pray to be close? Father, thank you for our, that we're here now, uh, in your purposes, here to listen to one another and to you. We pray you'd help us that our conversations and discussions will guide us into resolving some of the challenges that we've begun to highlight and that we will see that sense of your unfolding vision, hope for your church and confidence in the gospel. So be with us for the rest of our time together and gather us together tomorrow as we do move forward in our discussions. Let me just talk us through the next wee while. Um, there's a useful app at this point for anyone who needs to go check into a motel um, to go and to do that. Um, anyone who doesn't need to do that, there are books to look at or carry on catching up with one another. Um, that wonderful Anglican moment known as Creed and Franks will be on at about 5.30, leading into dinner at 6. After dinner, there'll be some slightly more structured networking. We'll be out in the foyer and there's, you know, all those little tables. Well, we've got some um, questions and conversation starters and things to kind of to think about um, along the lines that Bishop Andrew was doing with us earlier on, but some slightly different ones as well, and some things which might make us laugh. So that will be after dinner. Tomorrow we can be back here for breakfast at eight. This allows people to avoid the peak hour traffic. Um, I mean, not from Tauranga. I know that Tauranga has traffic. And getting here by eight, we can avoid most of that. Um, then there'll be morning worship and uh, Bible study, which Alan Burnett is going to be taking the Bible studies for tomorrow and the next day. And then, of course, after that, there'll be this clever 10-minute window while people migrate into here, um, using the restrooms on the way or just moving around as we need to. Um, and then we'll be back with you, Christian, tomorrow morning for um, the local establishing a mixed ecology. So here we go, motels, books, whatever we feel like doing, walking around outside if we need to stretch our hands. Thank you. 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 Thank you.